I, I cannot improve my um, my connection better than this because of where I am in the deep rural area of KwaZulu Natal. So that is why we are going to co chair the Honorable Gillian, who probably is sitting in a better spot than myself. Uh, may, may I, if there is any delegation from the from the minister, from the minister now? Good morning, Chair. Um, morning, Chair. This is Joe. Um, I was speaking to the minister earlier. He was he was struggling to 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 connect. So we we still trying to to connect, Chair. Okay. Uh, who is there with you, Joe, from the ministry? Well, I I could see on um, on the list, Dr. Luazi Manzi is there. Dr. Anban Pile is there, but I'm sure they can they can unmute and introduce themselves. Okay. No. What what we will do now? I'll hand over to my co-chair, co uh, Honorable Gillian, who is also going to. Uh, make her comment and then uh, do the roll call for us, starting with the honorable members. Honorable Gillian, I have muted myself, waiting for you to continue. Good morning, Che. Can you hear me now? Yes. Can you hear me, Che? Good morning, honorable members. Good morning, Chairperson. Um, and this Freedom Day 2020, it's an honor for me to welcome everybody to the joint meeting of the Portfolio Committee and the Select Committee and Health during this difficult time that we are faced with in the country. Chairperson, I think um, one of the, the, the key issues that I want to highlight this yes. morning is to welcome Cuban delegation of medical doctors that has arrived in the country to assist us in fighting this pandemic. I am also very um, honored to, to be part of this meeting this morning with our members of the Select Committee of Health and Social Services in the NCOP. Um, a country is faced with, with, a, with an enemy that is invisible, but I, I also want to Hello. This thing goes on mute. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay, sorry, this thing I just went on mute. Um, so from our side in the NCOP Chairperson, we are privileged to be with you this morning. And also, um, one of the key issues, I think, is to thank the Minister, Deputy Minister, and their department for all the effort and hard work that they put in for the last few months in, in the issue um, of combating this virus. Chairperson, um, I think the citizens of the country is, is, is very fortunate that the minister can give them some updates from health on a daily basis. And I think we really need to um, to highlight the issue that 
everybody in this government is doing everything in their power to assist us to combat this virus. This morning, we are fortunate to have the presentation from the Minister and the Department of Health on issues that um, that people in this country is, 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 is asking questions and faced with, and also that we as the Select Committee and the Portfolio Committee this morning will have the opportunity to do our oversight work over this department. Um, with that few words, Chairperson, um, I also want to, to ask the members of the Portfolio Committee and the Select Committee to give us an indication who are here. I can, I can say that all members of the NCOP from the Select Committee are present and I will allow them to just um, say greet them and, and then after the select committee, I will ask the member members of the portfolio committee in the National Assembly to also give us an indication of other. So I will start with a roll call from the NCOP. After the NCOP, the members of the portfolio committee can also just give us an indication who are present. And with that few words, Chairperson, I thank you. Can we start with the, with the NCOP members who are present? Can you just give us an indication? No, who's all I'm doing? Morning, Chairperson. Good morning, good morning. Chairperson, it's elegant Chavelin. Good morning, Chairperson. Ms. Lynn Lutuli, KZN. Good morning, Chairperson. It's Good morning, Chairperson. from Pumalang. Morning, Chairperson. Nogu Zolandongeni from Eastern Cape. Good morning. It's Dalmain Christians from the Northern Cape. Which member Pa? Good morning, Nokili from Northwest. Good morning, Chair Mbulelo Baha from Gauteng. Thank you. So all the members of the NCOP are present. Can we have the portfolio committee members to give us an indication who is present, please? Good morning. Uh, Good morning, Member from Stalin is present. Good morning, Honorable Isma present. Good morning, Anna Kela from Khaoteng. <coughs> Good morning, morning. Good present. Good morning, Naledi Shiva from Khaoteng present. Jacob from Western Cape present. Morning. Good morning, I'm Eastern Cape present. Good morning, Harry Western Cape present. Shaky mom. Uh, good morning, it's Hani Hendricks present. Good morning. Is that all the members of the of the portfolio committee that has given indication that they are present? Have you heard me, Chairperson Shaky Mom? Yes, I did shake. Thank you. Okay. If you heard uh, member from Chairperson, uh, Chairperson, did you hear me? It's Hendricks. Good morning, Chairperson. I did hear you, uh, Member Hendricks. Thank you. If the members of the portfolio committee has in given indication that they are present, I want to move to the department if all of the members of the portfolio committee has given indication that they are here. And I want to move to the department to give us an indication who is all present. Good. Good 
Good morning, Chairperson Sokacha, if you heard me. Yes, uh, Member Sokacha, welcome. Thank you. <coughs> Let's Good move morning. to the department. Good morning, Anbin Pele here, Acting DG, National Department of Health. Morning, Dr. Pele. Is and is the colleagues of you here yet? Um, yes, Chairperson. Uh, there are a few colleagues I see that are, are logged in. I think they can introduce themselves. Uh, good morning, Chairperson. This is, this is Gail Andrews, National Department of Health. Good morning, Chair. It's Ian van der Merwe, CFO at National Health. <clears throat> Thank you. Is there more from the department? Good morning, Chair. Dr. This is Good morning, Dr. morning, morning all the Chair. Uh, Joe, Joe Hatla, PLO. The, the, the Minister is still struggling to connect, but the IT guys from Parliament are assisting. I've just sent them uh, his number. Okay, thank you. We will wait on the Minister. Is there more members from the department that is present, Dr. Pillay? Um, Chair, I don't... Good I morning, don't Chair. Chair. Uh, good morning, Chair. It's Sibun Gubana, the Chief of Staff. I'd also like to tender an apology for the Deputy Minister. He had indicated he was part of the delegation that received the Cuban Medical Brigade last night, well, early hours of this morning, and he had indicated that he may not be able to join because they were only landing um, in the early hours of the morning. Thanks. Thank you. Um, um, morning. Morning. So morning. Yeah. Morning. Morning. Annelie Swatsele from the National Department of Health. Thank and you. And Team DDG yeah. Primary Health Care. Yes. Good morning. Good morning, Chair. Yes. I'm Valerie Rennie, Head of Corporate Services, National Health. Welcome. Dr. Pillay, is that your delegation? Can we continue? Um, no, oh, well, we don't have the minister here <laughs> yet. Yeah, yeah. I think um, I will hand over to the chairperson um, while we wait for the minister to join. Chairperson Lomo, I'll hand over to no, you no. now. No. Must we wait? Honorable Yes. Thank you very much. Uh, Dr. Dr. Mkiza is leading a delegation of very powerful DDGs and DDs. Okay, so, uh, and I spoke to I spoke to Dr. Anpan yesterday. Yes, I see the camera. Do it the way we should be doing it. We will have Dr. Anpan start in the presentation. And the minister will then take over when he joins. Yes, I can't hear you. So what I will do, I will hand over yes, to Dr. May be a to take us. <clears throat> Your sound is very, very bad. So Dr. Pillay, I will hand over to you to take us through the presentation. And then after the presentation, I, I think the minister will be with us. And then the minister can speak to us before we move on with the with the rest of the agenda thank you i will hand over to dr Pillay. thank you thank you chair um 
Shay, I don't know if you have a, a copy of the of the presentation. We don't have access. Dr. Pillay, I believe Dr. the president. We will was... not have that copy uh, as promised because by nine o'clock yesterday, I checked with you, there was no presentation as yet. Okay. So I think um, if, if our secretaries can just make sure that the presentation that will be delivered this morning be sent to all members. And um, then, Dr. Pillay, if you can get your presentation on the screen, I think we can continue. So I'm not sure if you can see the presentation now. It's not on my screen. Not on your screen? No, I can see you, Dr. Pillay. Good morning. Oh, good morning. Let me try again. It's not on my screen also. I can't see <laughs> And now check, can you see it? No. No? Okay, let me try once more. Yeah. May I request that while Dr. Anpan Play is doing what he's doing, we also recognize and welcome our parliamentary staff that has actually helped us to put all this together. We also want to welcome the media if the media also is joined us, we welcome you too. There we go, Doc. We can see it now. You can no, see it now. Okay. Yes. I think I'm also learning. Uh, thank you very much. Good morning. <laughs> Uh, if I can can take you through some of the slides. Um, so, firstly, uh, just to give give you a sense of the uh, the the spread of the infection globally, um, I think that these numbers this morning have uh, certainly exceeded the numbers here. But at the point at which we put these slides together, uh, these were the numbers globally. I think we're close to three million now, much closer to three million than we were then and closer to 200,000 deaths. Uh, so you see globally that we're looking at around uh, uh, plus minus 3% uh, deaths uh, overall, uh, which is fairly significant. Um, but there seems to be quite significant disparities in the in, in the death rates across countries, some countries having lower than 1% and some countries much higher. I think trying to understand the reasons why there are differences in these mortality rates across countries is, uh, is important for us to, 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 to understand so that we can plan for our own response in this regard. And then if you look at our, our, our COVID response relative to many of the countries within, within the region, uh, which is the table on the right-hand side, you have the total number of confirmed cases at the point we put this together. We have South Africa at 4,220, uh, way above many of the other countries in our region, the DRC, Mauritius, uh, Tanzania, and Madagascar being the closest, but uh, much lower than than uh, what we are currently. Um, so the the static region has uh, has in total uh, reported about five thousand seven hundred and fourteen confirmed cases, about and one hundred and forty fatalities. And this has largely been uh, come uh, come through uh, from South Africa. Um, Egypt and Algeria on the continent are the other uh, large contributors to to the uh, infection rate. <laughs> This slide uh, looks at the uh, comparisons in both the cases and the death rates. The slide on the left basically provides the uh, cases and the slide on the right is related to the deaths. What you can see is that uh, as per the previous table that South Africa is uh, way above many of the other countries. The closest comparator is Egypt and, and Algeria. 
uh, who has seemed to have uh, similar rates of cases to, to South Africa. Uh, what's interesting, though, is if you look on the right of that, is the uh, deaths, and you see that uh, Algeria and Egypt are still uh, higher than South Africa when it comes to deaths. So we, we appear to be doing better on the deaths, but we clearly have more cases than they do. Um, I think one of the lessons here is uh, uh, making sure that you're able to 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 test and and identify the cases early so that they can be managed much more quickly and protecting those who are at risk. Uh, and then we have the DRC, Mauritius, etc. Uh, the 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 curves you can see from from many of the countries have uh, uh, appeared to have flattened. Uh, in this region, uh, we need to see whether this is going to be sustained over time or, or continue at the, at the level that we're currently seeing it. These are global comparisons. And here you can see South Africa's doing uh, uh, much better relative to the, to the global trend. Um, uh, the US is, is now uh, the leading country with cases, uh, followed by Spain and the UK, and then uh, Iran and China. Uh, uh, in terms of cases, which are on the left-hand side. On the right-hand side, you have the U.S. Hello. So, sorry to disturb you. Sorry to disturb. I, am I the only one who's not seeing Anpan and his uh, presentation, or all other members can see the presentation as Anpan is doing it? We can see it. Uh, so the problem might be on your side, Jefferson. Yeah, no, I we also can see it. Yeah. No, no, if I'm the only if I'm the only one, then that is fine. Okay. We'll no, continue it... like that. Okay. Okay. I'm so, sorry, Chairperson. Um we'll see how we can fix that. Um then the the uh total confirmed uh debts on the right hand side and you can see south africa is still very low in terms of the number of debts um relative to many of the other countries uh that that have significant mortality uh well above the the, the thousand mark in most cases um and uh, i think that's that's uh, uh the high burden of, of debts across the world uh, coming chair now to the to the uh, um, APN surveillance data, the reported cases. This was as of the 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 twenty sixth. Um, uh, the numbers of uh, change every day, uh, and you can see that the total cumulative cases is four thousand five hundred forty six at the time, which is about a four percent increase in cases. Uh, so about one hundred eighty five new cases. Uh, and the national case fatality rate is sitting at about 1.9. Um, as a, uh, Globally, it appears to be 3%. So we're still much lower on that score. Um, and, and we can see that there are differences, nevertheless, in terms of that across the, the, the provinces on the, on the number of deaths that we're seeing. Uh, obviously, uh, uh, KwaZulu-Natal and Western Cape are the big numbers there, uh, and then followed by the Eastern Cape. We need to follow this very carefully to understand how we how we deal with this with this case fatality and identifying those at risk. Um, this is a, a graphic description again of the total cases, uh, the daily new cases, and then the the deaths as well. Um, uh, the 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 clearly the the hotspots in the country are the uh, metros uh, in Gauteng, uh, um, uh, that's the city of Johannesburg, the, the uh, Ikurleni area, and then Swane, uh, Mangaung in the, east, in the Free State, and then uh, Itekweni in uh, KZN, Buffalo City in Nelson Mandela Bay in the Eastern Cape, and the uh, city of Cape Town in, in, in the Western Cape. Uh, these appear to be the biggest drivers of the epidemic across the country. Um, if we look at the uh, the cases and deaths since first reported, uh, you can you can see the the trend as it appears currently. The um, the the um, trend appears to 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 have uh, um, increased. Although you'll you'll notice at the at the point of uh, of the introduction of the lockdown that the the curve to, uh, uh, um, took a took a turn as such uh, or a knuckle as it is called. 
uh, and and the 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 number of cases uh, or the rate of increase had reduced. Uh, we're hoping that this trend will continue, but we need to uh, to watch and see as to as to uh, what other measures need to be put in place in order to bring the the uh, the, the the steepness of the curve down. This refers to the uh, uh, number of deaths since the first reported case. Uh, you can see the the uh, deaths appear to be at a, at a very uh, uh, similar rate over the period uh, since the first death, which was reported uh, around the 26th of uh, of March. Uh, the number of new daily uh, COVID cases as well as deaths. Uh, the uh, the the top line shows you the uh, the number of new cases. And the bottom is the number of new deaths. Uh, you can see that the the number of cases uh, have been following a trend, but uh, uh, closer to 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 about uh, middle mid April, there seems to be an, an uptick in the numbers. Uh, this may be largely linked to the uh, uh, test testing and screening that is being done on a door to door basis where we're trying to seek uh, uh, persons that, that may be positive but uh, are unaware of their status um, and, or have not sought uh, uh, medical care. Remember, uh, prior to this, we've largely been uh, operating on a passive system where when one feels ill, they go in and uh, um, are, are tested and are, are then identified as COVID positive. So clearly when we... Uh, um, go in and also look for positive cases, we will then find them clearly and this will, will increase the numbers and this to, to a large extent contributes to some of the, the increases in numbers that we've had. Uh, the the uh, uh, deaths have been, uh, uh, well, following an, an, uh, an erratic trend, you can see on some days we have 12 deaths and other days we just have one or two. This largely is a function of the, of the uh, at-risk population and when they actually contract the disease. Uh, this, this is again a graphic de depiction of that broken down by provinces. Uh, the, uh, the the Eastern Cape is in green. Uh, a free state is in is in uh, yellow orange. Hopefully, it's the same color on your screen. Gauteng is purple. KZN in blue. Uh, Limpopo. Um, I'm not sure if you can call that olive. Uh, uh, Mpumalanga green. Northwest is uh, green as well. Uh, Northern Cape. And then there are some cases where. Uh, when the when the lab uh, result, uh, um, samples are taken, people provide an incorrect province or don't provide the province, and uh, this then results in an unclassified or an unknown group as such. And then the Western Cape. What we've seen uh, over the, the 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 past few days is a huge spike uh, from the side of the Western Cape. It, uh, previously, Gauteng had been the province with the highest number of cases. This now has changed and you can see that Western Cape uh, uh, seems to be having more cases and something is driving that, which I'm sure our colleagues in Western Cape would be able to to, to provide more detail within the next few days. Um, in terms of laboratory services, um, the total number of uh, tested at the point of this, uh, this slide was 168,643 uh, and those newly tested was uh, 7,639. What you will see is that the number of tests that are being done in the public sector now exceeds that being done in the private sector. This is largely due to the fact that we're having a lot of door-to-door -door screening and, and are trying to identify people that are potentially positive and in the community itself. So this this table provides you with the community screening and testing. Uh, the total tested is uh, 22,906, which is about 14%. Uh, 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 passive case finding is people that actually uh, come into a facility and uh, uh, ask for a test or, or come in with some illness and are tested. We see that these are the these are the, the, the percentages and the numbers. So we, we still don't have a lot of people that are 
uh, uh, we're finding that are potentially at risk. Remember, the screening involves firstly screening an individual for, a, for, for the potential risk that they have uh, COVID through a symptomatic assessment, and thereafter they referred in for a test. So we see in terms of the new tests, uh, that it's about 7,639, and the total again, as I said, 168,643. Uh, and the, the public sector clearly is uh, now in ramping up in terms of the number of tests that it's doing as the door to door numbers and uh, uh, households uh, increase. Uh, the COVID tests that are being done uh, by data are reflected in this graph. So these are the number of new cases that have increased despite an, uh, a decline in the test volumes over the past few days. Uh, these are both the public and private set. The public is in the dark green. The uh, uh, sorry, the, the private is in the dark green. The public in the light green. And then the cases are the are the line graph. And what you can see, the total number of uh, of, of cases by day uh, obviously increases as the number of tests increase. You can see that in the in the left graph. And you kind of see a similar picture on the positivity rate. I think the, the point I made earlier is that even though we're increasing the number of tests, we're kind of seeing a positivity rate that is uh, hovering around the 3% range. I mean, it goes slightly above that, slightly below that, but uh, on average, it's in this line. So as we seem to increase the tests, uh, doing the door-to-door, -door, et cetera, it doesn't seem to be making a very big difference in the positivity rate, which kind of suggests that the, 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 the community level spread is still at a, at a, at a low level relative to, to what it is in many other, other environments. <clears throat> the number of uh, uh, tests performed by date, again, are, are indicated here, uh, private in green, the public in, in, in orange, and the cumulative total is the, is the blue line, uh, which you can see the number of, uh, of samples that are done. Again, just to give you a sense of the uh, public and private tests, uh, uh, I suppose in the last uh, uh, few days, you've seen that uh, the NHLS has been uh, really uh, ramping up its tests as it uh, gets more and more cases through the door-to-door -door screening. Um, in terms of the community screening, as of the 24th of April, um, 5.8 million people have been screened nationally with 41,000 that had been referred for testing. Uh, the case referral rate uh, uh, does differ by province. You can see that uh, in the Western Cape, the rate is probably the highest, uh, followed thereafter by the Northern Cape, um, and then the, the KZN and the Eastern Cape. Um, so this is a very interesting trend in terms of the number numbers that are screened and referred, which uh, kind of uh, aligns with the with the uh, previous <clears throat> slide as well around our um, overall positivity rate, which still seems to be fairly low, even though we're continuing to increase our levels of screening. In terms of contact tracing, as of the 25th of April, a total of 19,765 contacts have been identified through tracing, which shows an increase of about 8% uh, if you look at that on the previous day. So the national coverage rate has increased from 89 to 91% with the Eastern Cape around 87 and the uh, Western Cape at 82. Contact tracing clearly a critical part of the uh, the work around prevention as we identify the contacts to make sure that they uh, remain uh, in quarantine as we determine their status because they become the, the, the reservoirs of, of further infection uh, in the community. In terms of hospitalization, uh, you can see that uh, nationally the total number of cases are 4,546, recoveries 1,637, Deaths are 87. Um, the the cases are in the in the green bars. The recoveries are in the orange bars, and the yellow bars refer to the deaths. Uh, the the provinces with the highest burden clearly have the highest number of uh, 
of cases uh, and the the recoveries uh, are, are looking very good in Gauteng as well as uh, uh, in in KZN uh, in in um, in the Western Cape. This thing still seems to be lagging behind, and they have. Uh, a massive uh, uh, case number relative to where they were, um, and I think that that needs to 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 be more clearly understood. The the other provinces are doing uh, uh, fairly well relative to to these three provinces. In terms of the uh, hospitalization data, those that are hospitalized, isolated, uh, in high care ICU, etc., you can see that our ICU utilization rates are still fairly low. Uh, um, those that are on ventilation as well, fairly low. Uh, oxygen is in the green. If you see at the bottom is hospitalization. Uh, the the orange is the uh, isolation, high K in yellow. Um, the, the darker green ICU, then ventilation and then oxygen. And you can see across the provinces in general terms, uh, there the is not a high demand for high K currently. Uh, ICU ventilation or oxygen rates uh, relative to when you would get into a surge period. So clearly, this picture also seems to suggest our our, our hospitals are currently not overwhelmed at this stage in terms of uh, uh, increases in the number of cases. In terms of quarantine sites, there are um, a total number of 288 quarantine sites. Uh, not all of these sites are activated immediately simply because uh, the, the, the number of people that need to be put, put into quarantine may not meet the number of sites that we need. So we have clearly more sites than we, than we need at this stage, but uh, we have to keep them in wait. Uh, if we have a, an increase in the number of uh, cases identified that need to be placed into quarantine, these are ready. We currently have 28.1% of our sites activated. You can see the uh, the provinces with the with the sites and the activation rate. Uh, in the Eastern Cape, for example, most of the sites are not activated yet, and so in the Free State as well. Uh, quarantine beds. Uh, this basically goes into the detail of the number of beds. You can see we have 20, 23,000 beds and uh, currently about 37% uh, of those, those beds are being utilized. Uh, we're largely putting in people in quarantine who cannot self-quarantine. The other area where uh, quarantine is being used quite widely is uh, South Africans that are, that are returning or repatriated. Uh, they, they get quarantined usually in the province where they arrive at. And uh, so that's why you notice that Gauteng is so high, uh, simply because there are, uh, most people come through the OR Tambo airport and they go directly into quarantine at a hotel there. And then the second province is the Western Cape. Some flights are going through there, and that's, that's the reason for that. If I can then turn to the risk-adjusted strategy for economic activity, I think the president announced this uh, recently, and then uh, Minister Lamini Zuma and Minister Patel uh, announced the strategy. So I thought I should take you through the detail around that. Um, basically, I think that the objective of our strategy is that uh, if we do not take any measures, we know that this is the kind of curve we're going to get. Uh, this is the health system's capacity, uh, um, and we need to then reduce the curve so that we remain within the within the capacity of the health system. And we do that by uh, applying a number of measures that will reduce this. Our intention through the risk-adjusted strategy is to see how this curve does not exceed our capacity. At the same time, bring on act economic activity uh, within that that environment. I think it's important to emphasize in terms of economic activity that uh, the pandemics itself uh, will depress the economy. Public health interventions do not. And I think this is evidence from the 1918 uh, Spanish flu epidemic. So from the Spanish flu epidemic, what, what has been very clear is that those economies that decided to move early in terms of restarting their economies uh, without the infection rate in their uh, uh, um,
countries being reduced significantly uh, had a negative outcome from an economic perspective relative to others. So it's really critical that the economic activity waits for the uh, public health intervention to achieve its full effect before the economic activity is, is started in, in, in to any significant extent. Um, you may know that the restrictions on the economy will need to be adapted, as I indicated, to the to the trends, and uh, that that this may require us to uh, have a system of what we call an alert system that clearly allows us to 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 relax or tighten the extent to which uh, the the uh, economic uh, activity can proceed. And so we, we are um, currently in the process of reviewing the uh, comments linked to this alert system, which was released uh, on, on Saturday. Uh, and the alert system basically has five levels. Um, and this these levels are largely dictated by the health uh, status or the health response. So uh, if the epidemic is increasing, then clearly we need to get to higher levels of alert, lower economic activity, and uh, um, the, the converse is also true. So as the, the, the level of the epidemic reduces, we may increase the economic activity. So the alert system allows us to do that. Uh, uh, just this depicts this very clearly in this slide. You can see uh, level five is a level where you have high virus spread or, or low readiness or capacity within the health system, followed by level four, which is a moderate level spread. Uh, um, and then there is low level of readiness or capacity. Level three is also moderate spread, but with moderate readiness. Uh, the high readiness at level two and then low viral spread and high system readiness in terms of capacity. Our intention is to is to use this mechanism to classify provinces as well as districts so that uh, over time we would have a differential uh, a response to the virus uh, in terms of its spread and our readiness. So where there is low levels of spread and high capacity, uh, we would be able to allow greater economic activity. As I pointed out earlier, the the main epicenters of the of the virus appear to be in our metros across the country. So the uh, key factors that we will uh, that we looked at in coming up with this alert system is the risk of transmission, that is uh, the ease of implementing the mitigation strategies. The expected impact on the sector for uh, continued lockdown that includes uh, you know, our prior vulnerability of the Dr. sector. Dr. Pillai, Dr. Pillai, let me, yes. before continuing, let me just um, alert uh, the meeting that the minister has joined us. Um, and um, let me just um, welcome the minister in our meeting and then you can continue. Thank you, Dr. Pillai. Okay. Thank you. Morning, Minister. Thank you, Chair. Thank you very much. Thank you. Please proceed. I'll, um, I'll come in at the end. Thank you. Thank you. Um, so the, the, the third fact is clearly the value of the sector to the economy, uh, both in terms of its contribution to the GDP, the multiplier effect, and export earnings. Uh, uh, clearly, the, the, the main uh, criteria that is the risk of transmission or the health factors, uh, and thereafter the economic factors uh, come, into, come into play. So the way uh, this uh, system was, uh, was envisaged is uh, my colleagues in the economic sector had uh, gone through each of the, the different sectors from uh, um, manufacturing to wholesale and retail, agriculture, etc., looked at the contribution that each sector has to the GDP, looked at the employment contribution, uh, small and medium enterprises, uh, the economic linkages, exposure, etc. cetera, uh, looked at these factors and classified industries uh, within each of these, these various areas, and then went through to, to ask questions such as the proportion of the payroll that is likely to be paid in the end of the month, what is the risk, risk related to retrenchments, the proportion of large firms in the industry, proportion of SMMEs, etc., and did a classification of this largely. And this, this slide gives you an illustrative example of how that was done. This is just a, an example. It's, a, it's not a, 
uh, the, the the full piece of information. And this then uh, was brought together in terms of uh, the factors, as I indicated, the uh, the key key being the low transmission risk uh, being regulated and organized. Uh, where there is localized or low movement of people and enabling other factors so that uh, uh, the, uh, the economy can, can continue to operate. So coming to some of the restrictions that are uh, that have been uh, released as part of the levels, uh, these restrictions will remain in place after the, the, the kind of national lockdown. And uh, even if we're at level four, uh, these restrictions stay in place uh, relating to, to, to sit-down restaurants and hotels, bars and shabines, conference and convention centers, entertainment venues such as cinemas, theaters and concerts, uh, sporting events, the religious, cultural and social gatherings, um, no more than 10 persons outside the uh, uh, workplace permitted. Uh, the the recommendation that everybody wears a cloth mask uh, when they enter vehicles and use this when they're uh, uh, um, outside of the home as well. The the use of sanitizers, which which has been in place for a while now. Um, so the the additional rules are that uh, companies encourage their employees to adopt a work from home strategy where that is possible, and that staff try and work as uh, remotely as much as they can, and where that's feasible, uh, employers need to to look through how that can be done. Uh, workers that are above 60, uh, as well as those with comorbidity, should uh, 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 negotiate with their employer to work from home, as uh, the, the, this group yeah, has uh, enjoyed higher risks of both, both morbidity and mortality from the data from other countries. Even if you look at our own mortality stats, uh, a similar picture uh, comes through. Uh, that there should be workplace protocols in place to uh, monitor the, the disease and its spread. So when re workers return, uh, they should be screening, they should be testing uh, continuously because the workplace can certainly be one of the environments where the, the virus can spread. That would then lead to uh, a widespread infection, much more than what we currently have. So that's one of the areas we need to monitor. Uh, uh, we also need to encourage employees to wear cloth masks. The work environment should have sanitizers and social distancing is important within the work environment. Uh, in addition to that, before any sector resumes, it's important that the, the health and safety protocols are in place, that uh, the individual businesses and workplaces have a risk assessment plan in place and to conduct health education with their employees. So it's not simply a case of employees just going back to work. Uh, they need to, to be educated about the risks of COVID and various measures need to be in place within the workplace to prevent the spread of the infection in the workplace. That requires that the employer provides employees with sanitation, good ventilation, uh, distancing in the environment, uh, and making sure that they monitor the sick employees and, uh, and, uh, and ask them to remain at home, uh, and having a system of reporting that so that uh, that can be monitored at a national level as well. So um, the proposal is that the, uh, the levels of alert are one to five. The National Command Council will make that determination upon a recommendation from the Minister of Health and the Minister of Trade and Industry. Uh, there will be a single national alert as well as alert for provinces and even for districts at some point. Uh, this will be determined largely by the number of cases and the changes in the number of cases over time, uh, as well as the capacity of the health system within the province and district um, uh, to, to, to manage that. Uh, where uh, individual departments uh, wish to expand their activities, they would consult with the Minister of Health uh, to, to obtain directions as to whether the potential expansion poses any risk. Um, a working committee will be established between uh, both the Department of Health and the Trade and Industry, where the both ministers would uh, uh, look at the, the evidence linked to the risk of infection as well as the economic activity in a particular area. Uh, thank you. Okay. 
Um, thank you, Dr. Pillay, for that um, brief um, presentation. Members, I will, I will hand over to um, Dr. Mukizi, our National Minister of Health, um, to, to give his input. Thank you. <clears throat> thank you very much. Uh, I hope I'm visible. I can sometimes not see whether I'm visible or not. But uh, I want to just apologize. There's been quite a mix up with the uh, codes to get into the conference. So I couldn't get through uh, for a while, but uh, thank you for proceeding with the presentation. Let me then say that uh, there are a number of uh, other issues that were raised by the portfolio committee that uh, we would probably want to touch on them. Uh, it might just be useful to get a sense <clears throat> from the committee uh, whether uh, we could, to, could do that straight away. Uh, otherwise, I think what's important for now is that we wanted to just share the latest as to where we are in, with regards to the uh, uh, response to the outbreak. Uh, there are a few more things which we haven't gone into. For example, um, I'm sure you <clears throat> members would be aware at this point that uh, we, we're seeing changes in the outbreak on a day-to-day -day basis. When we started, the Gauteng pro uh, province was the one that had the highest, and things have shifted uh, with uh, uh, now the Western Cape being the epicenter. The problem which we are seeing is that uh, there's a changing pattern there. Uh, the pattern is that we have um, uh, uh, our uh, outbreak, uh, cluster outbreaks, which are happening in workplaces which were originally identified as essential services. So uh, from the look of it, looks like we have to find uh, additional support and uh, to strengthen the response of the province into that area. Similarly, KZN <clears throat> has also been quite high, uh, but we are now also concerned because the West, the uh, Free State, which was uh, higher, <clears throat> has now been overtaken by the Eastern Cape. Now the pattern again is different, whereas in the Eastern Cape, in the in the Free State. The pattern was based on uh, one uh, incident where there was a church gathering <clears throat> where many people got infected from that. Uh, that has been contained because for the past few weeks now, the numbers have been kept stable around 110, uh, 104 to uh, just above 100. Then uh, the Eastern Cape has shot up. Now, if you look at the Eastern Cape, the incident, the 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 outbreak is driven by social gatherings, as, uh, mainly funerals. And uh, then, of course, <clears throat> it happened in the correctional services area. We had to put in reinforcements immediately there uh, <clears throat> because this was located in an area which is densely populated, that is the correctional services. So we, we are now going to be looking at uh, uh, re the distribution of the uh, specialists coming from Cuba so that we can reinforce <clears throat> some of the places that we're dealing with. The other issue relates to what has been raised by uh, uh, Dr. Uh, Anban Pillay in the presentation, and that is we are seeing increasing numbers from the public sector. That, <clears throat> excuse me, that is for us uh, quite encouraging. <clears throat> However, we think there's still a long way to go, but uh, our constraint is really more the supplies uh, of our diagnostic kits that are taking a bit longer uh, to get to the numbers that we're looking for. Uh, they, we do every day get explanations as to why there might be delays. So we have still not exceeded our capacity. In other words, <clears throat> we don't have specimen that are waiting to be tested just because of the shortage. We just want to be sure that we are ahead of the uh, the, the need. So we, 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 we just mentioning that as a point was as we move on, 
the past two weeks has actually assisted us to get more uh, uh, community screening to happen and more people to be taken into testing. So this we expect to continue for the next few for, for the next few months actually. Uh, and South Africa is really not done badly <clears throat> compared to the rest of the world. Many of the countries have not done as much as what we have done. But what we are happy about is that we are targeting now in the areas where there are problems. Uh, we nevertheless think that uh, <clears throat> it's going to be important for us to uh, keep a watch on the supplies of the diagnostic kits because that's really where our challenges are going to come from. So uh, having said so, <clears throat> I think that uh, uh, we, we would want to elaborate uh, on some of the questions that have been raised by the uh, portfolio committee. So you could probably guide us. If you would like us to deal with them now, those that have not been already touched, we can do so. But if, if uh, you've got another plan, we can then look at it. Thank you very much. Um, <clears throat> Minister, I think, um, is Dr. Glomo still there? Yes, ma'am, I am. Okay, well, you continue um, chairing now, Dr. Glomo. <clears throat> yeah, thank you very much, and welcome to the minister. We were alerted that you might be delayed, so we started with Dr. Anpan Pile, who has assisted us with the uh, presentation. I was going to uh, <clears throat> that uh, you, you continue with the uh, questions uh, that were raised because we have agreed, uh, maybe I don't know whether this was translated to the, uh, the select committee, that we will not then bring you questions now, uh, but that batch that we sent, if you could do as much as you can, but because uh, our my chairperson, Gillian, maybe did not send her team questions. <laughs> we could maybe take some of them and, and open a space for them, uh, because I don't know whether they were able to send questions to you, uh, Dr. Mkize. If then, uh, that is, we can do it that way. Uh, for us, it would be clarity seeking, but not uh, uh, new questions that are going to come in from us for today. Thank you, okay. Chair Dr. Glomo. I think let's allow the members of the NCOP to raise their questions. Um, as you are aware, we had to leave one of our meetings very early um, because we, we were caught up in a lot of meetings. So I think let's allow the members of the NCOP, if there is any clarity seeking questions, they can raise it and then the minister can um, once of answer, if we can agree on that chair. So, so if I may just uh, try and understand it, you're suggesting that we don't deal with the questions which have been asked, wait for the new ones and then answer all of them at the same time? Yes, doctor. Because I think the NCOP members did not have the opportunity to ask the questions. Or maybe if it will be better if you can answer the question that you receive because um, maybe there can be an overlap in the questioning. And then if there is still clarity seeking questions, then the NCOP members can come in. I think continue answering <clears throat> the question that you received, uh, Minister. Okay. No. Okay. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much. Let, let me start with the question that was raised that refers to the number of patients admitted and recovered from ICU and on ventilators. I assume that that would have come out because it's part of the slides that you would have uh, uh, tabled. Uh, uh, and um, because it's a table, I would like to ask that uh, uh, Acting DG can fly the slides and pick us that particular aspect of the slide, and then uh, we, we can just go through it. In the meantime, I'll deal with the next question. The one question was whether the flu vaccines will help in the fight against uh, coronavirus. The real response here is that uh, the, we have got many 
different viruses and uh, there are different families. So the COVID-19 is a coronavirus, which is different to the viruses that tend to cause the flu, which is influenza viruses. Now, normally the flu vaccine would be a combination of uh, strains of the um, uh, influenza viruses. And so it does not have a direct uh, uh, um, impact on the immunity against the COVID-19. There's no kind of cross immunity across these two uh, viruses. But what it does, it basically reduces the chances of people getting uh, influenza uh, in, uh, infection as a flu, and therefore it actually reduces the level of uh, morbidity or the heavy burden that would have been if the person would have had both the flu as well as COVID-19. So this basically saves people from the one type of a, a viral infection so that they might be facing one inf infection only. So that is really the benefits <clears throat> out of that. So it basically <clears throat> does not stop anyone getting a coronavirus, but it actually does reduce the numbers of people who will have a flu. Was if, if we also remember that our flu, uh, the influenza virus tends to have a large uh, a number of people who are affected, and it's actually got a very high mortality. It's just that because we're used to it, we no, normally don't uh, think of it as a major, a major killer. At the moment, uh, on, on record, <clears throat> the numbers of people who uh, have been killed on, uh, from the influenza virus tends to be much larger. And it's estimated that globally is 300,000 to about 600,000. So it does become a pressure point if the two together would, uh, would were, to, were to come to the same individual. That's one of the things we're concerned with as we're going to winter, that uh, we have two of these burdens coming at the same time. So that's the value of the flu vaccine would only come at that level. Then there was a third question that refers to people living indoors lacking vitamin D and therefore the effect of uh, coronavirus in the light of the fact that the scientists claim that the exposure to sunlight boosts, boosts immune system. I think this might probably be some um, uh, elementary observation that people might be trying to make an association, but we don't have any randomized controlled studies that can prove that that is the case. So uh, sunlight uh, is good for you, fine, but uh, that you can link it with coronavirus, uh, it's, not, it's, not, uh, it's not something that we've got evidence of. Then the next question is about communities with no water, no electricity, no food, no exposure to sunshine, living in a single room, no ventilation, how are they expected to fight coronavirus? Well, to start off with, people who are living under those conditions, it's really more because of the poverty that uh, <clears throat> our country is experiencing. It's not so much that there's anyone who uh, uh, would be left into those areas by design. It's something that happens because uh, communities and society and government can't cope with the pressure in terms of the levels of poverty. However, uh, Work has been done uh, quite a bit. I don't have the figures here, but uh, there's been a lot of focus, particularly from the National Coronavirus Command Council, to uh, reach out to areas where there's shortage of water, to bring some uh, water tanks uh, and make them available to assist some of those communities. Uh, every day we see the Minister uh, of Water and Sanitation moving around trying to uh, help to give attention to that issue, together with the uh, uh, local government, the various municipalities. So this becomes uh, one of the areas where we are concerned about the fact that uh, it, uh, the shortage of water ex exacerbates the problem of uh, uh, sanitation, uh, lack of sanitation or poor sanitation in the communities. The issues of electricity is the same. Uh, and of course, <clears throat> we know that in our uh, informal settlement, this is one of the biggest issues. We do understand that there will be a bigger challenge in dealing with uh, for those communities to face the coronavirus. But in particular, the densely populated communities are going to be even more difficult to manage because of the fact that uh, the numbers uh, 
of people who get exposed from one person can be quite large and uh, isolation and treatment at home and uh, quarantine becomes more difficult there. So we have had to bring in uh, the aspect of getting uh, quarantine sites where you can move people out of the congested area so that they could be uh, quarantined somewhere outside their own living um, uh, environment just to be able to help them through the period when they're supposed to be dealing with and fighting coronavirus. <clears throat> so uh, that, I think, would be uh, our response there. Then the next question is, when does the minister believe it will be safe for South Africans to resume normal life, given that uh, we're approaching the winter season? Well, the presentation has put that quite clearly. <clears throat> we have... Uh, decided on trying to classify the different areas. We don't think that uh, the uh, response or the return to normality will be all symmetrical and will happen at the same time. What it will mean is that there will be areas where you'll be quicker to return to normality. There are areas where we're going to be more measured in the way we're going about it. The uh, president has called it risk-adjusted <coughs> uh, uh, uplifting of the lockdown. That basically means that uh, you see how we've classified the, the, uh, the, the various uh, levels. Uh, in this case, we are at a level where the level of uh, preparedness is very low, as well as uh, the level of transmission is very high. Now we have to move to a point where the level of preparedness is high and the level of transmission is lowest. And that uh, it goes through the five stages that have been highlighted. The question really is balancing out the uh, various aspects which is a return to normal activity uh, versus a reduction of the uh, risk of uh, transmission of infection. Now, <clears throat> we already have that situation, which is very complex now. We designated uh, food outlets as uh, being the areas where we have essential services. We also designated the other areas, such as the those involved in the health value chain, such as the production of medicine and so on. But that's exactly why we've had a cluster outbreaks. In Cape Town, uh, several shop right, uh, 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 shops have actually been closed, and uh, one GlaxoSmithKline uh, factory also have had to be closed with so many people that have been found to be positive. So you're going to find that uh, it's not going to ever be a straightforward issue. So if in the one instance <clears throat> the, we would have uh, uh, understood that the rate of transmission is still very high, then uh, we'll actually reduce the, uh, the numbers of industries that must be started and be put in operation immediately. On the other hand, uh, where we think that uh, things are getting uh, well and the re transmission rate is low and that the you know, actual economic activities can be resumed, We'll move into that, but as soon as we start picking up the numbers going up, we are forced to actually close down some of those sites. I think the examples of the Western Cape uh, has been the, <clears throat> the is what's going to happen, and we must expect that there will be areas where we will say uh, it looks like we can proceed with uh, you know bringing up normal economic activities and open up various industries and uh, transport routes and so on. But there will be areas where we might have to stop that and say, look, we thought this was safe. It's no longer safe. Let's go back. So you will be having different areas where the approach is not going to be symmetrical. There will be areas where we might actually recommend that uh, whilst the, the lockdown is uplifted, but in this particular area, they may not be, uh, in, it may not be helpful to actually do so because of the level of transmission that we are seeing. So that is how we're going to have to face it. There is going to be uh, as we go along, we try and uh, and see what is the best for that particular time in the area. Uh, <clears throat> then there was an issue raised about uh, uh, people forced in, to be in isolation in Limpopo uh, and in Clarksdorf. Well, let me just say, in principle, um, we, we always classify people as having either um, when they are positive, they will either be asymptomatic or mild to moderate, or they'll have a much more severe kind of infection. If they are asymptomatic, mild to moderate, then uh, they don't need to be admitted in hospital. They can be treated 
in their own environment, in which case we expect that the doctors could then place, uh, could assess the situation and then decide that the individual can be treated on home isolation, particularly if they are asymptomatic and mild and uh, <clears throat> the conditions are such that they can do that in their own homes. But if we find that uh, uh, the, someone is serious, then of course they need to be treated in hospital. But we do make exceptions now where someone is mild or uh, even asymptomatic but positive. At that point, uh, it, might be, it might become important to say, let's get them treated in hospital even though they are mild, simply because they are causing infection and their environment where they live is such that it's not possible to uh, treat them without getting them infected. We've already got cases here of people who were discharged from hospital when they were improved, but they'd gone back home and actually infected others, other members of the family. Because being well and being uh, capable of uh, spreading infection are not the same thing. You can spread the infection uh, even if you are well. And so some of the people will need to, need to be kept in hospital because they can still spread the infection even if they are not feeling that they are symptomatic themselves. Then there are other areas where there are problems of uh, uh, cooperation <clears throat> between the patient and the, uh, uh, within their environment when it is felt that uh, you know, then the individual needs to be taken into a, a quarantine or a, a hospital isolation. So uh, <clears throat> we have had this situation that is a reason in uh, Limpopo, uh, there were the doctors who were patients. There were two sides of the story here. On the one side, the doctors felt that uh, uh, they were well within their uh, you know, uh, rights to be treated at home and so on, and they were not very serious. But then um, the uh, Limpopo uh, government had felt that there was a problem with the cooperation and certain information that was shared amongst them. However, we went into the matter, and uh, after discussing with Sama and the MECs, we actually then said that what was important is to try and uh, get the doctors to make a, 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 an evaluation as to whether uh, there is a problem with the person at home. And then, of course, it looks like there could have been some misunderstanding between the doctors and where they are uh, um, a, a house assistant was and so on. But at the end of the day, the matter was taken up with uh, uh, the, I think Sama took the matter up with, uh, 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 you know, with the legal teams and uh, ultimately uh, the, the matter uh, uh, got resolved because the patient, where the patient was removed and the legal teams were actually discussing the issue as it were. I think it was unfortunate because in this case, uh, what really becomes important is to try and uh, find adequate understanding amongst all parties so that the process of treatment does not become a, a, a contentious issue. But there have been a few instances where we were to involve uh, legal systems to deal with the matter. Then, uh, uh, so in Limpopo, that matter was resolved at that level. In the case of Cluster, uh, the, again, the policy is not very different, but uh, in this case, it would appear that the patient uh, was taken to a designated ward, which was used to hold uh, uh, patients. Uh, they were waiting for the results, and that uh, at the moment, they have five patients awaiting results that are also being uh, uh, treated for other medical conditions. So we, 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 we don't have there uh, any record of anyone was forced into isolation. In the case of Limpopo, there was actually a court application that made <clears throat> that was made, and then the court granted that, and it went, it went through. But it's a, a situation where I think uh, if there was the, there are ways of avoiding those, we, those are the ones we need to avoid, particularly because uh, the people that are involved are uh, doctors who should be able to understand uh, when there's proper discussion as to what should be happening. So as to um, uh, what the situation is now, as far as we'll be concerned, uh, that matter uh, ultimately was, was resolved in, in Limbopo as well. Then uh, the, there was an, a question raised about what about the facilities uh, for, 
for quarantine. Now, <clears throat> I've got a, bit, a, a table here which I can share, but uh, basically what uh, we are doing is that for a number of, for all the provinces, we're looking for sites where we can make it possible for people to be taken out for quarantine uh, because of their uh, conditions. Uh, densely populated areas will be very difficult to, to uh, quarantine themselves at home. So in a number of instances now, people have been moved from their homes. So uh, in total, we have about 8,832 beds across all the provinces. Uh, and uh, the numbers of sites are 89. Uh, we can send that uh, uh, to, to the portfolio committee um, because it's just a table, so I don't think it's necessary to go through all of that. The, then the other question was around facilities that have been assessed and are said to be compliant. Here, again, we've got um, 310 facilities that have been uh, identified with 23,598 beds. So this is to say uh, we can actually absorb uh, that number of people into beds. And our understanding is that if people are not sick at the same time, you can actually go quite a long way with those numbers without uh, feeling the pressure uh, of uh, uh, the over overcrowding. Uh, then the question was, other question was the number of people admitted in hospitals. We need to provide clarity regarding the numbers uh, in, the, in the private sector. <clears throat> that was already tabled. Every day we count how many patients are in the public and private. For a long time, we were having mostly the patients in the private sector, in the private uh, hospitals. It's now changing, and I think the presentation that was done by the uh, acting DG would be able to show us those numbers. Um, but if, because the numbers change, <clears throat> I wouldn't read it now, but the, 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 the last number that we had, uh, I think as uh, of about 24th, was 317 patients. Uh, 175 in public, 142 in private. Um, then it's broken down according to various provinces, although about three provinces uh, did not have uh, any patients uh, whatsoever. Others had some in public and others had some in private. So we can share that as well. Then the next issue was the uh, when will we be using the gene expert uh, equipment? Uh, in this case, uh, we actually have started using the gene expert uh, equipment. They have recently done some validations. Uh, the challenge here is that gene experts can be quicker, uh, <clears throat> but the, the challenge here is that uh, um, we, we have <clears throat> limitation in the numbers of kits. At the moment, we've just received uh, 10,000 kits, and those kits uh, uh, are going to be uh, used largely. We've moved a lot of them to Cape Town, to Eastern Cape, uh, Wasn't Natal, and Gauteng, and Bloemfontein. Bloom uh, there will be another delivery of about another 15,000, which we expect uh, from today onwards. And so we expect that they will also help to improve. Uh, this uh, uh, capacity. But the gene expert kits are actually produced in the US. So since the US had put in a, a restriction on the stuff being ex exported, uh, the other company is now uh, operating out of Sweden. And so they've got some challenges that they've reported to us. And we are hoping that they will get over those challenges and then uh, make themselves uh, able to, to give us more. They've promised that they'll be increasing their supplies to us. But we are aware that the whole continent is also looking for the same kits. And so there's going to be quite a, a challenge as to whether they can cope with the demand from both our country and the rest of the continent. Uh, it's something that we'll see as we move along. But we are in touch together with the Africa CDC to look at how <clears throat> we can assist uh, each other in this process. Then uh, the next question was the availability of the PPEs. Now, I think the one way to explain this is that 
Um, we, we do have PPEs, uh, but what one has seen is that uh, every now and again, <clears throat> there's an evenness in the distribution. So you might find that in one district there is in certain hospitals and other areas you don't have. But there are also areas where we've got shortages. I was in the Western, in the Eastern Cape uh, last week, and uh, our reports were, had been showing that they were still managing with their PPEs. And then uh, when we looked at the report, and then when we got in there, we found that the uh, doctors uh, were presenting, uh, started uh, raising the concern about the PPEs and the staff who were feeling that uh, they were being exposed. And we thought the, the, that's serious because our record <clears throat> was indicating that uh, they had been, uh, you know, on 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 course in the supply. Then we found that, in fact, uh, what they were now having were a large numbers of stock that's being ordered but not delivered, and that becomes a problem because uh, the, there's a lot of price uh, speculation out there. So if you uh, uh, wanted to buy at a certain price, uh, you know, suppliers move on to someone who can buy at a higher price. And so that has become one of the issues. We intervened immediately to make sure that uh, we went into the stop, into the stores where the store stuff uh, was being stored, and we actually moved some of the PPEs quickly to go and deal with the issue of uh, uh, Eastern Cape. However, uh, we have also then gone into uh, look at the uh, private sector suppliers. Uh, I met with them and looked at the stocks that they have available. Uh, we, we actually still do have some stocks, but the level of commitment by the provinces means that sometimes they think they are waiting for an order. If it doesn't come, then they run short. So we now need to always have a much more active approach where we'll say uh, that uh, the stock that is available uh, somewhere stored must actually be distributed to the provinces which need it on that basis, irrespective of the fact that they might be waiting for an order where they've committed their funds from. So there must now be an easy way of withdrawing the money from an order that has not been delivered to purchase for immediate supplies. So we're going to be doing that now <clears throat> as we move on uh, to make sure that uh, we deal with this issue. In terms of the orders that have been put in place, uh, <clears throat> the orders should be able to cover the next uh, six or so weeks uh, uh, going forward. The, there is a process whereby the Solidari Solidarity Fund has uh, come in to assist. I would say Solidarity Fund is operating more as a bridging finance <clears throat> to help the suppliers to procure the stuff, bring it into the country. And then once it's stored inside the country, then uh, uh, the provinces can then go and order and then still uh, the provinces have to pay for the stuff. Uh, so that, that that whole mechanism, one has been trying to understand how it works. Uh, uh, I think we just need an active uh, management of that section so that we can deal with the with the uh, orders and uh, try and uh, make sure that we don't run into sub, uh, supply problems. All we must be able to affirm uh, is that no staff member, no professional, no health worker should be put in a situation where they must be uh, going to see patients without being protected. That is not correct, and so <clears throat> we're going to be actively dealing with that. So as a result of that, when I found out that there was this challenge in the in the uh, uh, Eastern Cape, we actually got the uh, manager in charge of the whole issue of procurement to walk now pers you know, personally on the various hospitals and check the stocks themselves just to make sure that we've got the uh, exact figure. So we do see that uh, uh, you know the, the, there's a problem in the way that the, the stuff is being ordered. So we're going to deal with that. We do have a table, <clears throat> excuse me, we do have a table that gives the sense of uh, requirements and stock at hand and so on. It does show that there's a lot that we still need to purchase. Uh, I can make that available as well to the members as it were. But we have also now uh, uh, formed what we call the Occupational Health and Safety Committees, which involve um, uh, officials in the department, particularly the Commission uh, on uh, Occupational Health and Safety, together with the representatives of trade unions, as well as uh, other academics and uh, public and private sector representations. This team 
we have actually assigned them the responsibility to uh, raise the issues of uh, safety of our health workers. And in so saying, uh, they should feel free to be able to actually help us to audit the stock. So it's one thing what the manager will report, it's another what they will then uh, uh, report and check and we will then act on the basis of that information. I think it's going to be very helpful to be able to deal, to deal with it uh, that way. Then the question is around ventilators. <clears throat> well, uh, uh, at the moment, uh, we, we understand that <clears throat> we do have ventilators in the public and private sector. We, we haven't used so many yet. And so the question of uh, future need, based on what we have seen in the US, in this Spain, in Italy, and so on, so uh, there have been companies in the country that uh, are working with the Department of Trade and Industry, such as Ford, who have actually uh, agreed to uh, manufacture some of the ventilators for the needs of South Africa. Uh, we've also been talking to <clears throat> the clinicians uh, to look at what uh, needs to be done. And so uh, we've actually been uh, looking at the Universitas uh, gave an interesting proposal where they're working with uh, uh, <clears throat> uh, some, uh, I think, Danel or some uh, uh, in the uh, defense uh, industry, uh, a company that was uh, manufacturing CPAP uh, platforms. And we thought this was interesting, and so we've got our team to look into that, particularly because uh, we believe that uh, uh, if it's manufactured inside the country, it's something that's going to be easy to achieve, to, to, to obtain. But secondly, the, the general discussion now is that uh, there should be less agency or, or less uh, rush towards putting people on the intrusive ventilators, that we should start them on CPAPs. So if the, trends con the trend continues, it allows us space to actually uh, you know, uh, reach out to more people who will be covered with the CPAP uh, uh, equipment than uh, they need the, <clears throat> the ventilator. It's a real matter of balancing the issues. So we're still working on that with our ministerial advisory committee. <clears throat> the issue of mortuaries, readiness, and symmetries. Uh, here we've got uh, some numbers, for example, that the uh, mortuaries, uh, cemeteries, and crematorium, we've got a capacity to deal with 36,000 uh, storage facility for human remains. So uh, the private sector undertakers have got about 28,000, but the government has got about 8,000. So what we are therefore looking at is that uh, we're going to be engaging um, more of the uh, 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 players in this sector so that you can create uh, even uh, temporary capacity for storage. And I think this issue is one of those that we're going to, have to look at fairly carefully because it looks like <clears throat> we need to uh, start encouraging communities not to store human remains for too long, uh, even if that was not uh, COVID related, so that uh, we do not run short of uh, space, particularly because uh, uh, you know, once it's a funeral, it's a funeral. You don't want to have too many people. You don't want to keep a long time. We also don't want too much long contact with the with the uh, human remains, as it were. So all of those are uh, issues that we're going to be working on as we move along. Uh, we can also give a sense of the breakdown of all of these storage capacities. There's a table that deals with that. The other issue <clears throat> that was raised relates to the uh, reports on vaccine against COVID-19. Uh, <clears throat> it is said that, firstly, let's start by saying that uh, for a new infection such as this one, the only way of protecting the whole uh, population is for the population who had to have what is called head immunity. Now, there are three ways you get uh, immunity uh, as a human being, either you get an infection and then your body develops antibodies uh, to fight the disease and then those antibodies stay in your body so every time that that uh, uh, pathogen whether virus or bacteria comes in then of course they get attacked the uh, those uh, are the immunoglobulins uh, IgM Ig IgG <clears throat> which are really part of the normal immune response of the body the other way is when the mother 
uh, is giving birth and therefore through the breast milk, the, all the, the antibodies that they've got will be passed to the baby through the breast milk and that's uh, uh, the <coughs> IgA antibodies which help to protect the baby so that when they are not familiar with all the viruses but the, that the mother has got, they don't get sick as a result. The third one is a vaccine. Now vaccine basically means that we have to introduce into the body a kind of a, a, a agent that has got features of the offending virus and the body responds to that but the uh, um, the, intro, the part that's been introduced in the body is not dangerous to cause an infection. And so you get uh, uh, immunity built that way. Now that we need to go into that direction because uh, <clears throat> there are not enough, uh, there's not enough time to develop this immune system for everyone. So if we could have got the vaccine, that would have been useful. This is just to say that we do need the vaccine. <clears throat> and uh, in the process of needing the vaccine, we need to be aware that uh, before it is finally it is uh, made available, there's got to be a lot of trials that have to be done. There are about 40 different uh, vaccines that are being tried, they are being developed throughout the world. But four of them are progressing to a level where uh, countries are at the phase one le uh, level of the trial. So that is UK, China, US, and Australia. And uh, now the next phase, uh, which uh, you know uh, should start in a matter of a couple of months, is the one where many countries are going to be participating. And we believe South Africa has to participate at that level because uh, one, we've got uh, adequate clinical and technical research uh, expertise to be able to monitor that vaccine uh, trial so that we've got the best kind of outcome. It's a contribution towards the world knowledge uh, around uh, the, um, this particular disease. But at the same time, if we don't participate, uh, it means that those countries that would have been in the forefront of the development of the vaccine through their trials would be the first ones to be able to get uh, access to the vaccine and therefore will actually be behind the curve, <clears throat> behind the, uh, the end of the queue to get this. And we don't think we want to wait that long. We want to be amongst the first countries to be able to receive uh, the vaccine when it's proven to be positive, to be successful. So from that point of view, uh, we believe that we need to uh, you know, work together in that level. Now, I'm raising this point because I've seen that there were some comments that were made in the public media about vaccines. But actually, scientifically speaking, the vaccines are a correct thing to do. And uh, the trials are done in such a way that they're no longer the kind of uh, offensive trials that used to be done in some of the, you know, uh, uh, olden days where people would just actually just go and do research, <clears throat> not caring about the human rights. All the research work that gets done now is mediated via uh, ethical committees, and there's no way uh, some abuse can be accepted or tolerated uh, in the in the in the case of uh, some of the uh, 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 trials that we that we're talking about. Then <clears throat> the issue was the uh, one other issue was around the criteria for admission to the ICU. Uh, basically, we have the uh, guidance from the various uh, intensive care and critical care society and specialists who would then uh, give a broad guidance in terms of what uh, uh, criteria has to be used to take patients to the ICU. So we would say that uh, largely we leave that uh, to be in the guide of the specialists who deal with that particular issue. Uh, somebody asked about whether there's likely to be another lockdown in the econ <clears throat> economy. <clears throat> well, I think uh, that question has been overtaken by events in the sense that uh, <clears throat> the NCCC has now indicated that there will be a way of easing off, but it's not going to be just a, you know, a once-off uh, easing. It's going to be a staggered, risk-adjusted approach and therefore, since that was tabled already, I won't spend too much time uh, uh, talking about that. The other question uh, relating to the PPEs I'd already asked, is almost the same question. Uh, and then somebody asked about bleach to use on clean surfaces. Uh, well, all we can just say is that there, there are a number of disinfectants that are being used to clean the surfaces, and we encourage that people must use those 
to be able to deal with elimination of possible contamination coming from droplet infection on hard surfaces. And that's going to be one of the ways we're going to be dealing with issues going, going forward. Uh, Pelonomy reported that they didn't have sufficient PPEs. Uh, we can only just check. The last time <clears throat> we checked this, uh, the, everyone, uh, even the, in the province, they said there is a, a general challenge, uh, but um, they have stock uh, right now. So I think it depends when you're counting and uh, when the orders are coming through. Uh, I've raised the issue that we're going to be much closer in managing this issue as a, as a department. Uh, then there's a question about the call of uh, foreign trained medical doctors <clears throat> to assist in the services. Uh, I would just say that at the moment we have actually approached China and Cuba to get those who are foreign trained doctors to come through. Uh, however, if we're talking about foreign trained doctors, who are registered uh, in South Africa, uh, there shouldn't be a difficulty in getting them to assist when uh, we've got posts available and if we uh, come in also either into those posts or they come in as volunteers. It becomes important to make sure that if you're gonna use as doctors, anyone who are trained as such, they must be registered by the HPCSA first before they can actually practice because that way we can then be assured of the quality of their training and at least that they are suitable to actually work inside our country. Honorable Minister, Honorable Minister, if, I, if you can allow me, please. Um, we've got 20 minutes left of this meeting and the chairperson of the <coughs> sorry, portfolio committee <coughs> do have a question to still pose and myself on behalf of the NCOP. If maybe we can allow Dr. Glomo. Thank you, Dr. Glomo. Thank you. We will wait for the questions. Okay. Honorable Minister, uh, on the side here, I have been speaking to my members uh, to maybe bring new follow ups because, uh, as you are rightly putting it, this is a, a moving target. So I have four questions that are collated from members and Honorable Gillian is also going to come with three additional ones. I, I think you have covered well and uh, Honorable Van Staden was asking the issue of PPE as whether it is not creating a threat to the staff members. I, I'm sure you have said a mouthful on that, but if you want to say something more on that, you could. A question from Honorable Janji is to what is the rationale of uh, <laughs> allowing cigarettes to then start being um, available to South African citizens and the, during this lockdown? Uh, the third one is to maybe you need to we need to comment that the House Limpompo and Western Cape are showing good statistics on per districts. Now we don't see that in other provinces. What could be the what would be the reasons uh, for that uh, uh, unevenness in terms of provision of information? The last one is that uh, we would like a, a bit of another ex expansion on is Eastern Cape really having big challenges? Uh, uh, have you said it all about challenges that you probably encountered in the Eastern Cape? Those are the four that came from our members and which are current issues that maybe you can assist with them. Then I hand it back to Honorable Gillian. Yes. Thank you, Chairperson. Um, Honorable Minister, I've got some questions from Pumalanga. It's um, the issue of the state. Um, why it's taking so long? And then um, uh, member Maleka wants to refer the table provided um, in the breaking down into provinces. And see, the question is, uh, in Pumalanga, it states 4385 tested, 23 infected, zero deaths and 13 recoveries. So she really needs to know where is the 13 and from, from the 23 infected. 
member let to leave um let me just get to remember let to leave question member bach has got the question is concerned about the eastern cape with regards to the incoherence approve approach and reporting on figures that are not synchronized with data in the NICD. How big is the problem? Member Latulu from KZN um, wants to know, can the minister and the department confirm how true is it that Eddington Hospital in KZN has allegedly been hiding coronavirus infection rate? If so, what is being done about it? Can the department also assure us that all these people who are out there testing our people have been tested negative? Then only one concern from my side, Minister, is um, I am I'm getting a lot and lot of messages from the people in the Western Cape to 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 find out. How is the National Department going to assist the Western Cape um, as the Western Cape has become the epicenter of the virus? And then the other one is the concern from parents about the reopening of schools and how is the, the health um, department advising the Department of Basic Education and Higher Education and um, to deal with the with the opening of schools. Thank you, Minister. Chairperson. Chairperson. Do you still have a question? Chairperson. Chairperson. You can continue, Member Chabaleng. Oh yeah, yeah, thanks, 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 Minister, for the for the brief. And most of my questions uh, were answered in your in your brief. Um, I just want to know, uh, you know, there've been lots of perceptions in the in the media and the social media about corruption. Are there incidences of corruption that you can tell us about? And if they were, what actions were taken, for instance, to to remedy that and to ensure that uh, whatever happens doesn't recur? Uh, my other questions about Limpop were answered, but there is this, uh, uh, what was in the media yesterday about this person who died who was in Cape Town, was driven from Cape Town to Limpopo, died at the hospital. But the people who are staying with this person in the house are said to be to be negative. What what is what is happening? Is there any other information that you can give us that can help me understand this thing much better? Thanks. Thank you, Member Chabaleng. Is Member Christian still there? Do you still have an, a question before I hand over to the Minister? Member Christian from Northern Cape? Yes, thank you very much, um, Chairperson. I do have a question, and it is in regards to the referred cases in the Northern Cape, which are um, the referred cases in the Northern Cape are very high, while the prevalence of actual cases are very low. So um, when will we receive the results of the cases that were referred to in the Northern Cape so that we can have a true picture of what is actually um, the prevalence currently in the Northern Cape? And then just another question, as far as hand sanitizers and masks are concerned, what are the regulations around the wearing of these masks? Um, will masks be, be made available to our citizens? especially in workplaces, as obtaining one could be um, a problem for our general citizen out there. Um, what workplace protocols are in place um, and what will be our oversight role in checking whether um, workplaces actually adhere to these protocols? Thank you. Thank you, Member Christians. Member Bach, very short. Thank you, Chairperson. I think you've highlighted uh, one question that I raised. Uh, which has to do with the Eastern Cape. Um, that Eastern Cape, for instance, doesn't have 
a quarantine site um, and the fact that the, of the incoherence, um, incoherent approach and um, probably incorrect reporting in terms of figures. Um, how severe is the problem and what interventions are in place? And the last one, Chairperson, is uh, on testing. Um, what is the turnaround time in term between testing and the pronouncement of results? Is there a backlog thereof um, which could change the figures and reporting that we have if we um, have a backlog? Thank you, Chairperson. Thank you, member, members. I will hand over immediately to the minister. Time is running against us, members. Thank you, minister. Thank you very much. <clears throat> Let me try and be very brief, but uh, <clears throat> uh, some of the questions have been answered, if, have been asked a few times. Uh, I'm aware also that there are questions you asked which I have not answered, but if there's not enough time, uh, probably that, that's all we can do. Um, let me deal with the question of the uh, hand, turners, hand sanitizers and masks. We, we hope that the <clears throat> employees will, employers will be able to provide their employees with some of those. But uh, mask, we are encouraging everyone to wear the mask in public places. And the, we say that from the point of view of the uh, masks, uh, the cloth masks are adequate, and so people can actually make their own masks. It does, there's no government supply that's going to be made for people to get their masks. So we will want, want to encourage people to just organize their own masks. I've seen that already the public has started doing that, and they've even made them fashion already. Uh, workplace protocols, we're working on that, <clears throat> and so we will also, uh, basically they refer to the basics uh, hand sanitizers, distancing, masks, and also the numbers of people that must uh, you know, be coming into work, uh, they must be staggered so that they don't have a, a, a system that uh, overwhelms, but people must be screened so that people with symptoms don't have to come in. <clears throat> the case of someone who was uh, who died in uh, Cape Town and from Tulimbopo and so on. We were just checking a bit more information about that, but the simplest thing to, to say that if anybody is positive, does not mean that all those who are around that person may be positive at the same time. They can actually be negative. They need to be observed for 14 days. If they don't develop symptoms, then you take them as not having been infected. If they develop symptoms, then of course you have to treat them as such. And so. They need to be quarantined uh, and, and be observed over a period. Uh, the, there are no new specific cases of corruption that are related to anything to do with COVID-19, but we have our basic uh, approaches to fighting corruption, and that is investigating and also uh, using all the platforms we have uh, to deal with corruption, but there's nothing specific to the COVID-19. Uh, the question around the, Western, in the Northern Cape uh, the, the results tend to come in pretty quickly. The only de delay might be the transportation that might cause a, a delay with the uh, people, not with the uh, uh, hospitals being far apart and therefore it takes a while. Uh, I haven't checked how long it takes because of the vastness of uh, Northern Cape. There could be that problem, but it shouldn't be a problem that takes uh, too long because once the specimens are done, we are able to get the results very quickly. In the case of uh, uh, the turnaround time that's been asked, we don't have a backlog. <clears throat> About three weeks ago, we had some backlog, but now if we pick up a backlog in the system, we are able to get uh, the public sector to take over and do a lot of those specimens from the private sector and eliminate the backlog. So we don't have a problem now. So when we report now, uh, when we say 8,000 tests were done, they were done in 24 hours. And so we do that um, uh, quite rapidly now because of our capacity. In the past, it used to take a couple of days and a couple of hours, but it's much shorter now. Um, the, the reporting times <clears throat> are a bit of a challenge. When I report the results, I report up till 12 midnight, one minute past 12 midnight the night before, because we use the day to get the reconciliation to clean up the numbers, check who's been duplicated, who's done second, two, two tests, three tests, and so on, so that you don't rep report numbers that keep moving up and down. So that's what takes, it tends to delay the time. But we do have a system that actually tells us 
uh, immediately how many tests have been done. But uh, that system can tell us up to right now, as I'm talking to you, I can tell you now how many tests have been done. But it's not verified, so it needs to be validated. If you want to announce those figures, you will see that uh, afterwards what the team will do, they'll look at the numbers and then they start shifting people from this province to the other when they get the correct addresses, because sometimes people shift and change where they are and all of that. So that's back office work that gets done. That's what takes us a bit of, of a while before we announce the figures. We normally uh, do, do that work be, behind the scenes. Then uh, the questioning or question around uh, um, uh, the question around uh, well, how will we assist the Western Cape? I've been in contact with the um, MEC of now. I've visited the Western Cape before. We're going to be visiting again. We're going to be increasing the numbers of uh, kids that are going to the Western Cape. We're going to also be working very closely with the clinicians who are treating the patients to see what need, what assistance they need. We'll be checking their PPEs. We also want to reinforce and put additional doctors, including those coming from Cuba, and uh, we send them some more specialists, epidemiologists, and so on, where we think that there's a shortage. We're also going to work with them on planning, because uh, I was discussing now with the MEC, we need to break down uh, Cape Town into small blocks. Kylie Chai is one block, uh, Philippi another block, and all of these so that you can have a concentrated approach because of the large numbers of people that are involved at that level. Now, uh, <clears throat> we normally test people uh, on, on, uh, on the basis of the symptoms. So any one of our staff who's got symptoms will not be taken uh, into the field. And so we will then test them if they show, show any symptoms. The schools, uh, opening of the schools, there's a phased approach to opening the schools. But just for uh, members to know, the, the risk to children is not as strong in so far as contracting the infection. It's not so much the problem of the children. Uh, it's more the problem of how they will infect their own parents or maybe grandparents but when they come back. So that's what we're really trying to look out for. Uh, Addington, we're investigating the issue of Addington, but as far as we are aware, uh, it's not possible for a, a hospital to just hide uh, people who are positive. We just need to, every time we get any alert, we then say, go and check, check and test what's happening at the, at, at, in that particular hospital. In the Eastern Cape, I raised the question of the figures, and I said that uh, considering the numbers of uh, uh, deaths that we are seeing, it is likely that uh, if we do more testing, we'll discover more people, and therefore the figures would then probably be matched at that level. So that's why we reinforce and send more uh, testing mobile vehicles, as well as also uh, uh, as experts to go and assist and support them with PPEs and so on. That was because we need to make sure that the testing is done in a way that is solving the problem and it goes to the areas where there are suspicions of where the infection should be, and uh, then make sure that we can take people and quarantine them immediately. I'm not sure about this issue of uh, no no quarantine site in the Eastern Cape. When I was in PE uh, talking to the MEC, we were able to immediately get about 800 beds in the, uh, Nelson Mandela University to move people uh, from their homes at Wazuit, uh, what, they see, uh, what do we see, uh, into that uh, area so that uh, it can be removed from the area where there was infection. So that, <clears throat> uh, I, I would say, is not really that they have a problem uh, with, uh, with, uh, with, uh, treat with, uh, with treatment. Uh, uh, in Bumalanga, uh, most of the people there in Bumalanga have recovered. I think we've counted about seven who might still be waiting, awaiting. Even those will probably be discharging in a matter of a few days. So uh, I think there is less problems uh, in, in Bumalanga, <clears throat> but everyone must still remain um, uh, alert. There is a challenge in, in the Eastern Cape. The, the, there were shortages of uh, staff who had to actually assign a TDG to stay in the district of Nelson Mandela um, uh, Metro, and then uh, we'd also fast track the issue of the appointment of the chief director in charge. We'd also to uh, give them authority to appoint as many, uh, you know, doctors and, uh, and nurses, and uh, um, uh, close the vacancies that had been existing existing there for a long time. We are getting daily reports now. Uh, it looks like there's some work that's uh, the work that's being done is actually quite promising. The numbers are increasing, but we have to actually focus on how do we ultimately contain the spread, and that's the focus that we're, that we're dealing with.
the states per district, uh, we, we're gonna try and synchronize this arrangement uh, because <clears throat> uh, we normally just give the provincial uh, numbers. We leave it to the provincial totals. We leave it to the provincial teams to actually break it down to various districts. I, as far as I'm aware, most of the provinces are able to do that because when they give us the reports, they are, they, they are actually broken down into various uh, districts. And so uh, it's probably a matter of uh, making sure that they take it into the public. Rationale for cigarettes in the lockdown, well, uh, I think that uh, various other considerations would have been taken into account, but we, we can't debate the issue of cigarettes. And so far as uh, the health benefits are concerned, there are none for cigarettes. And uh, cigarettes, uh, as far as I know, and I'm sure Dr. Janty knows, we can uh, indicate to you all the side effects of smoking from the uh, you know, cardiovascular system, pulmonary system, causation of diseases, cancers of the lung, and uh, peripheral vasculopathy, uh, a whole lot of issues, uh, you know, that uh, are caused by cigarettes. So there's not much you can say about the benefit of cigarettes on health, and that's it as far as I would be concerned. Then uh, the issue of PPEs as a threat to members, I think that matter we were all similarly concerned and we'll do whatever we can <clears throat> to make sure that our people have got uh, the necessary protection or insofar as the PPEs are concerned. I can still continue if you'd like, um, um, uh, Madam Chair, but uh, uh, let me hold it at that one, the question that you asked just now. That's where I would like to leave it. Thank you. Chair, Chair maybe just to... Um, add on to what the minister said specifically in relation to KZN. The MEC for KZN has just responded because she's picked up the question in relation to Eddington Hospital, um, whether KZN has been hiding the COVID-19 infections. She's asked that we clarified that that is definitely not the case. The first infected case was a nurse whose husband was employed at St. Augustine's and then and was infected there. And as soon as the nurse tested positive, the matter was reported and the hospital CEO addressed the staff to inform them and they immediately traced the contacts of the nurse who were also tested. In relation to um, the Limpompo question, yes, the deceased patient um, had moved from the Western Cape to Limpombo and um, tested positive and then passed on. The contacts, there were 15 contacts that were traced who were also tested and they all tested negative. Thank you, Chair. Thank you very much. Um, I... I would like to hand over um, to um, Dr. Glovo, the chairperson of the portfolio, to just um, do his, the closing remarks of the meeting. Thank you, Doctor. Over to you. No, thank you very much for my co-chair, Honorable Gillian. Uh, thanks to the minister and the delegation of the minister that came along. I would encourage our members to continue sending us some of the information that they will need to clarity on, as we are aware that this is a moving program and we are grateful about the questions that have been asked. We would really want to end the meeting here now. Sorry to those members who started sending me some of their questions late, but we will all collate them and send it to the minister. Thank you very much, minister, for the wonderful work that you continue to do. And Thanks for bringing so many of the Cuban doctors to our country uh, to assist and fight on. And for me, that is the last to speak and the, uh, is the last comment for me. And then I'll ask my dear colleague uh, to close the meeting, Comrade Leon. Thank you, Chairperson. Um, let me also take the opportunity to thank the minister and his department for uh, making time this morning to come before the portfolio and the select committee and to come and answer and clarify questions that we have put through to you that is um, some concerns from the larger community in the country. Let me also thank all the members 
from both houses.